Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello young learners, welcome back to the uh, lecture series on introduction to science fiction studies. I hope you are enjoying so far. So in the previous lectures, what are the things that we have come across? We have come across the concept of science fiction, we have come across the concept of time travel, space travel, all of these things are there. As a part of this lecture series, I am sure you will be knowing that in a short time. Then we have talked about the big three authors, we have their Clark, we have Asimov, we have Heinlein and we also have people like Hugo Gunsback. Do you remember who Hugo Gunsback is? Yes, he is the first publisher of science fiction magazine. Apart from Clark, Asimov, Heinlein, you will also have come across Jules Verne, you have come across Aldous Huxley, you have got to know Orwell, George Orwell. So all these people you have got to know one by one. When you, yes of course I am forgetting, Ray Bradbury, ABC of science fiction, right? Asimov, Bradbury, Clark. And when it comes to Heinlein, you have considered, we cannot say AHC, so the big three authors, right? Then we have discussed Verne, Huxley, Orwell. We have also discussed uh, the novels such as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by R. L. Stevenson. So all of these things are very fascinating and uh, uh, shows us how the trend of science fiction has moved forward. Now we are moving on to a next kind of level, next kind of discussion of science fiction studies. In this particular lecture, we will be focusing on gender. Now many people, I will not name who, academicians, they mock, they try to make fun. I am just saying this in a very humorous tone. It is a dangerous concept to talk about gender. Gender is danger. But let me tell you, the danger that people feel while talking about gender is because it questions all the normative approach, it questions patriarchy, it questions everything that is inherent within the society, that the society values. It can think of an absent father in a story, but it can never forgive an absent mother in a story. So that kind of approach we have towards life at large, it is something which is deep-seated patriarchy, deep-seated male domination, where women do not have much representation, much scope for talking. Only a few decades earlier, women did not have the right to vote. Do you think that it shows the society, of course, we are, you know, the next generation, the next, next, next generation of that generation, which did not allow women to vote. And of course, today, I am standing in front of you talking of all these things because the society has progressed. Now, let me give you an idea when there is a structure, right? The structure is built from base upward. It is not like the first floor is made, then the ground floor is made, then the base is made. No, right. The base is made first, then the first floor, then the second floor. Like this it goes. The base of society has always been patriarchy. So whatever build you, uh, you keep on building on top of that, everything is based on the concept of patriarchy. And by patriarchy, I mean domination of the males that is rule of the father that is the exact um, idea of patriarchy rule of the father 
So in this lecture, we will be talking about women and non-binary authors. So whom do we call as women? We are not going to discuss that because the moment we start defining a woman, anybody who does not fall under our definition will think it as an exclusive definition. That is, uh, every uh, people must be some, some, something, some that. I will give you an example why I am not trying to define the idea of women. I will say, okay, women are those who have long hair. I can give you at least an example of 100 celebrities who are men and have long hair. So we cannot say that women are those who have long hair. No, okay, from the point of view of biology is destiny, we are going to say, okay, women are those who have a uterus, who have a female reproductive system. But let me tell you, gender, the um, operation, the sex change operations that take place in our country and abroad, what do they tell us? They tell us about a story of a human being who is born as a woman, but who feels like a man. So in order to be a man, he or she has undergone a surgery. The opposite also happens. If you define a person by the biological uh, aspect, then you stop understanding what that person feels. So now in the uh, area where identity is primary to every human being, where you need to produce an ID wherever you go, you must have your Aadhaar card, your PAN card, your this, your that, all sorts of card you need to have. And uh, it's a funny thing, uh, wherever you go, you first you will be asked whether you have linked your other card with your PAN card. It's an ongoing gag that people are doing. So everywhere you need an ID card. If you are working in an institution, you need an ID card for that. If you are going to withdraw money, you need an ATM card on which your name should be written. If you are going to vote, you need to have a voter's card. Everywhere you need to have an ID to show who you are. So it's a part of your identity, right? Okay, so when, who are the non-binary? Binary are two people, uh, two poles or two sides. Binary is zero and one. Binary is male and female. Binary is light and dark. Binary is day and night. Binary is black and white, the opposites. Right, so when we try to understand the society from the perspective of male and female, uh, men and women, we are creating a binary equation. But there are individuals in this society who do not fit that binary. They can be physically man and mentally a woman. It's a very uh, drab kind of, a very um, basic, I'm telling you. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the deeper kind of understanding. It's a very basic understanding that I'm giving you, a, a rough sketch, okay? So a person who is physically a man, but uh, mentally a woman, how will that person um, identify? Will that person write that I am a woman in an ID card? What kind of ID card is that person going to get? So they are called as non-binary. They constitute the lesbian, the gay, the bisexual, the transgender and the queer. All of these people, all of these identities, these are not peoples. These are not peoples. Remember, they are not people. What are they? They are identities. Right? So, lesbianism is an identity, gay is an identity, bisexual is an identity and all those are mostly sexual identities. Right? So, in this lecture here today, we will be discussing about the authors who are not men, who are women, who identify as women and sometimes are also they they go out and claim themselves to be non-binary first let us take a brief tour of the idea of gender and literature how are these two concepts connected 
do they have any common focus do they interact intersect at one point or the other let us have a look representation of gender literature has always been an uh, a place let us start with an example you take a book suppose uh, you are reading uh, let's say ramayan or mahabharat you are reading the story you read ha- uh, the story from the perspective of gender what do you get you get that there is a um, character there are male characters there are female characters the male characters are doing the warfare the female characters are doing some other things you start generalizing that okay that means the male characters they have this masculine aura around them and the female characters they are feminine and therefore they are not welcome in the war field i'm sure you um, if you just want to know what i'm talking about search shikhandi it's a book by devdatt patnaik search shikhandi and other stories you will find what i'm talking about so ev- every time you take up ramayana or mahabharata or any other tales you will see that there are men there are women but very interesting you will see that even arjuna was a uh, very talented dancer even bhima was a very good cook so these stories they not only give us the idea of what masculinity is they also talk about skill so even though you are masculine you have power you have muscle power you uh, you go and fight war even then you have taste or you have appreciation for art you have appreciation for cooking which is a survival skill by the way so all of these things are included in literature so how does gender get represented in these epics the representation is very neutral there is no way you can say that mahabharat is patriarchal or uh, it has always uh, dominated over uh, the female characters of course there are instances which are patriarchal due to the want of the era due to the want of the age they did not do so that they wanted to make a myth out of it but equally their women characters are also very powerful you can have and go uh, you can go and read then that is the idea of representation of gender that if i am representing women as very weak i am giving all the women characters in the epic a very weak moral character nobody is good everybody is lying everybody is cheating no here that kind of image is not given the image is okay they are capable of lying they have that intelligence but they are not using it because they know the difference from good and evil so they were very the women characters are having a strong moral compass right so gender is represented in that way in literature of course then you have gender bias in publishing nowadays back in the days uh, when epics were being written have you ever heard of an epic written by a woman why not why have you not heard because women were not educated at that time they had only one purpose in this entire planet that is to create offspring to reproduce that was the only thing they were born for at least that was the idea during that time you know no of a writer who is a woman writer of an epic right if you find one please do let me know uh, okay so gender bias in publishing even when women started writing for the first time they did not get publishers who will publish a woman's writing women cannot write that was the idea therefore you will find women started using male pseudonyms pen names they used to write under uh, let's say Art- arthur bell curris bell acton bell uh, i'm talking about the bronte sisters 
the in order to get their novels published they were writing under male pseudonyms can you imagine george eliot the best example george eliot mary ann evans that is the original name of george eliot in the victorian era she was writing politically charged novels can you imagine no publisher was accepting her work because a woman cannot write like this that was the idea okay so publishing industry gave women a very hard push back but women pushed back in their own way gender and genre this is something very interesting when it comes to science fiction science and women oh my god these two are most unlikely friends that is what the idea of the patriarchal society is but let me tell you nothing farther from the truth you know women have written absolutely wonderful science fiction novels and we will be talk about them very shortly so genre is something like women cannot write tragedy women cannot write a proper comedy this is not true every time the women are winning the nobel prize the women uh, of course in literature they are winning nobel prize they are winning booker prize you go and see the content you go and see women cannot write detective fiction do you even know what you're saying you just read the luminaries it is one of the you know fattest books and it is a detective thriller kind of thing okay wonderful book queer literature so gender and queer literature queer literature is almost non existent in public domain nobody knows about queer literature have you ever read a poem a short story a novel written by a queer person a person who is neither male nor female have you read anything like that uh, from a queer person a transgender person have you written a, a autobiography there are lots of autobiographies one is me lakshmi me hijra then uh, the story of my life all of these are autobiographies uh, one is by uh, lakshmi narayan tripathi why don't we read them we do not read them because we think oh no we are not going to read something written by transgender writers so there is a kind of prejudice i will write this word down over here there is a kind of prejudice about the non binary authors right gender identity and narratives like we had discussed before that the gender identity the gender identities are the most important concepts that are floating in the gender discussion discourse nowadays identities those are more important and how they are figuring in narratives that is a part of literature intersectionality instead of generalizing everybody let us break everything into smaller sections let us consider okay we are going to see how gender functions in india no not in india in the particular state of uttar pradesh no let's forget uttar pradesh in the particular place of kanpur we are going to think how in kanpur in this particular area called kalyanpur so we are breaking down the entire um, cosmos into smaller sections so that we understand them in its precise nature so instead of studying gender among indian women we are studying gender among indian uh let's say uh, women who are aged between 70 to 80 years uh who do not have their spouses uh have their children but they have they do not take care of them so they are also women you might not be guessing that i'll be taking the name of older women they are also women right so we are breaking them down into smaller sections to understand how they are appearing in literature or how they are getting represented in literature evolution of gender themes earlier the only kind of gender theme in any presentation was the difference the disparity between men and women this was the only gender theme but nowadays things have evolved things have evolved for the better nowadays we are taking into consideration lesbian gay bisexual transgender um cisgender plus all the categories we are taking 
note of all the characters and their identities. So it is no more uh, only men and women kind of thing, right? Gender and empowerment. When we talk about these identities, we establish them, establish them through discourse. What is a discourse? Discourse means simply talking. If we don't talk about these things, we will slowly forget. The civilization will forget. Our, our knowledge level, our knowledge base will forget these identities. In order to keep them alive, we need to discuss. Discuss it with academics, discuss it with engineering people, discuss it with interdisciplinary people. So that way we will be creating a great, uh, you know, think tank where we will be storing our new ideas and someday we will be drawing from them. Future of gender in literature. So now we are going to the future that, uh, of course, we are in the future uh, given the time when gender started appearing from. So where will we go from here to there? One step we are already in the future is whenever uh, nowadays English is being written and uh, an author or a person who does not belong to the gender, men or women, they are referred to as they. That is, if I say that Patricia, okay, so from here to what kind of future are we moving towards? So, we were discussing, let's say Patrick goes to the library. This is a sentence, right? So, the next sentence that we are going to use will not be Patrick, of course, it will be something like he, but suppose Patrick is non-binary. He does not identify as a man. So, we are going to use they. They look forward to getting the first copy of Harry Potter. So this pronoun that we have used over here, this is one of the representations of gender in the future, which is happening right now. Now let us move forward to get to know some of the most influential women authors in the field of science fiction. Number one is Ursula K. Le Guin. Without any doubt, she has given so many concepts. She has talked about so many things in her science fiction works, especially related to gender, that, uh, you know, it creates a very deep kind of discourse or conversation or commentary on gender issues. Known for her thought-provoking works, such as The Left Hand of Darkness and the Earth Sea series. So this is a part of series. So these two are parts of series. We will be looking at them in some time, okay? So what does Ursula K. Le Guin really do explore socio-political themes and challenges traditional gender roles. We will shortly see that in her novels how gender is approached. Octavia E. Butler, she is an African-American author. So number one, she is a woman. Number two, she is a black and black woman. And number three, she is writing science fiction. So she has to overcome three different stages of obstacles. First of all, writing uh, is something which is unexpected from a woman. Next, she is a part of that community who were slaves in America at one point of time. First of all, she is a woman. Then she has been uh, a part of a community in America who were initially brought as slaves. So there is a kind of prejudice against black skinned women in Africa. So she belongs to that community and the community which was subservient, which were uh, the people belonging to the community who were serving as servants, unpaid servants in the society, that community representative in this modern world is writing books on science fiction. This is unacceptable to the society. So 
she suffered a lot of pushback from the publishing um, industry. Whenever she went on with her books that I have written a science fiction, nobody really cared to publish it. But finally someone did and she became very famous. Compelling and diverse science fiction novels including Kindred, Parable of the Sower and Dawn, Issues of Race, Power and Identity. So she is one of the most influential, one of the most because the most influential is Ursula K. Le Guin and now it is Margaret Atwood. But she is not, I am not taking her name over here because science fiction is not really her area. Issues of Race, Power and Identity, Octavia Butler is again, I repeat, one of the most influential science fiction writers there is. Margaret Atwood, born 1939, significant contributions to science fiction with novels like The Handmaid's Tale and Oryx and Crick. Dystopian stories tackle gender and societal issues. I will give you a hint about Margaret Atwood. In Handmaid's Tale, she talks about a society, a dystopian world, where suddenly the fertility rates drop. Women cannot get pregnant anymore. Only those women who had already had children, they are abducted, kidnapped and taken to a place called Gilead where they are forcibly, uh, they are made to bear children. So that kind of, uh, you know, very horror stricken dystopian world. N.K. Jemisin born 1972. You can see Margaret Atwood is still alive. She is writing. N.K. Jemisin is also alive. She is also writing. Connie Willis. She is also alive. N.K. Jemisin, a contemporary powerhouse. Jemisin has won multiple Hugo Awards for her critically acclaimed Broken Earth trilogy. So there are three books that are very much uh, popular for N.K. Jemisin that is Broken Earth trilogy. It includes The Fifth Season, The Obelisk Gate and The Stone Sky, Themes of Power, Oppression and Resilience. So the Broken Earth Trilogy, uh, you will see I have spoken about this when I was speaking about Asimov, that Asimov has a whole series, foundation series, right? So they are set of three books, two books, extended, foundation extended, prequel to foundation, sequel to foundation. So whenever you are actually engaging with an idea, you cannot stop, especially when it comes to science fiction. The Fifth Season, The Obelisk Gate, The Stone Sky, Themes of Power, Oppression and Resilience. Connie Willis, born 1945, skillful blending of science fiction and humor in words like, works like Doomsday Book, To Say Nothing of the Dog and Blackout, All Clear, time travel and historical settings. These are her uh, domains. All of the works that she set, she sets in time travel and historical settings. Now we are going to know about Ursula K. Le Guin in some, you know, with some more details. She has written about 20 science fiction novels and over 100 science fiction short stories. She has won, she has been the recipient of multiple Hugo, Nebula and Locus Awards. In 2003, she was awarded the Grandmaster Nebula Award for Lifetime Achievement in Science Fiction and Fantasy. So not only did she achieve multiple Hugo and Nebula Awards, she also received the Lifetime Achievements Award, right? So she has written uh, a collection of novels which is included in the Hainish cycle. A number of novels and stories relating to the colonies of Hain. So Hain is the uh, most, uh, is the earliest of civilizations. They come and they populate Earth. They go to other planets. They also create colonies over there. And they are the people who are actually spreading life through the universe. So Hainish cycle, they call it. So we have the left hand of darkness, the dispossessed, the word of world in forest. It's a novella. The day before the revolution and the matter of Segri. These two are short stories, all belonging to the Hainish cycle of literature that Ursula K. Le Guin has written. Now we will get to know a little bit about Octavia Estelle Butler. She was born in 1947 and she passed away in 2006. She is, like Ursula K. Le Guin, 
also winner of multiple Hugo and Nebula awards. Let me tell you, Hugo award is the highest award in science fiction and she has been recipient of multiple awards. Not one year, she has received in number of years. A woman trying to break into the predominantly white and male science fiction community. We have discussed this before. I am reiterating the point that Octavia Estelle Butler is an icon. She has done what no woman before her was able to accomplish. That is, go and win award in a strictly white male dominated community. Ursula K. Le Guin, she of course, she belonged to the white uh, community. But when we call, when we discuss racism, although it is very bad to bring racism into discourse, but we must also acknowledge the struggle an author has gone through in order to make herself heard. So the work she wanted to publish for the very first time, it is the Patternist series. But I told you earlier, the uh, publishing houses, they were resisting her. They did not want to publish a black uh, and Afro-American uh, woman's work. What happened was she did not give up. So ultimately one of the houses, publishing houses took her work, published it and it became an international bestseller overnight. Right. So now we have Kindred 1979 is one of our most celebrated works, blending time travel with historical fiction to tell the story of a modern African American woman who finds herself transported back to the antebellum south. Now let me tell you what is antebellum south. Antebellum south is the place where slavery was actually happening in America, right? So this is a kind of story of our own life story of her parentage. So every science fiction has a metaphorical part, has an allegorical part. I have been saying that multiple times uh, throughout this lecture series. And here is the point that you find it. The Xenogenesis Trilogy comprised of Dawn 1987, Adulthood Rights 1988 and Imago 1989 explores themes of interspecies relationships and the survival of humanity after an apocalypse. Now, this is very in interesting. Interspecies relationships. That means I am a human being. I went to a different planet. I saw a different species and I fell in love with them. And I'm having a relationship with an alien. So that idea, to have that kind of idea is itself very uh, fascinating when it comes to science fiction. However, it is again a commentary on the um, couple uh, marriages that were taking place in America where the um, white people were marrying the uh, black people. That is the white skinned people were marrying the black skinned people or the black skinned people were getting in relationship with white skinned people. So this kind of uh, interracial um, idea has been blown into the a uh, field of science fiction using this relationship that is interspecies relationship. So whatever Octavia E. Butler is writing, there is a hint of racism, there is a hint of issue of women and gender and racism everywhere. The Parable series including Parable of the Sour 1993 and Parable of the Talents 1998 envisions a future America plagued by societal and environmental collapse and follows a young woman's quest to create a new religion based on empathy and resilience. We have had so many religions around the world. Can you imagine uh, the major religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Jainism, Sikhism, all these uh, religions propounded by a woman? No. We have no such concept of religion being propounded by a woman. But in this particular um, novel, the writer that is Octavia Estelle Butler, she has come up with this idea that women, one of her protagonists, the main character of her novel, she quests to create a new religion. She goes on to create a new religion of her own, which is based on resilience. Resilience is again 
when you are down, when you have lost a fight, but still you get up on your feet and fight back with all you have, that is resilience. That means you are not giving up. So that kind of idea, empathy and resilience. Empathy is you have fellow feelings, uh, good feelings or at least you understand the feelings of other person. If you cannot show sympathy, at least you must show empathy. Now we are going to have a look at the non-binary author, authors of science fiction. So non-binary again let me remind you LGBTQIA community authors where they do not confirm to a fixed identity of gender, where gender is considered fluid, right? Okay. So Anneli Newitz, an author and journalist, non-binary, she claims herself to be non-binary or himself to be non-binary and has written several science fiction works. Autonomous delves into, this is one of her works, Autonomous delves into issues of artificial intelligence autonomy and pharmaceutical piracy. I am sure you must have heard of this word, if not then let me tell you. Pharmaceutical piracy is a kind of crime that is happening in today's world. That is the pharmaceutics, what they are doing is they are selling the life saving drugs to the drug dealers, so that they can produce drugs which can, which are addictive in nature. right? So, that is pharmaceutical piracy. Neon Yang, a non-binary author and formerly known as J.W. Yang is known for their, see the pronoun I was talking about. Neon Yang is one single person, but the pronoun that is used is their, their tensorate novellas, a series set in a world of magic and politics. Kai Cheng Thom, a writer performer and therapist is non-binary and has written Fierce Famous and Notorious Liars, a dangerous trans girl's confabulous memoir which blends elements of magic realism and science fiction. So magic realism if you are not familiar with the term let me tell you what is magic realism. Magic realism is it is not entirely magic but it is happening even then. The most common example of magic realism there is, is the book called Midnight's Children. Midnight's Children is a book written by Salman Rushdie. It talks about Salim Sinai who was born at the stroke of midnight uh, on 15th of August 1947 when India got freedom, India won freedom. So then all the people who were ever born at the stroke of midnight on 15th of August 1947, everybody could uh, talk to each other via telepathy. So this idea is actually magic realism, it does not exist, nothing of that sort can ever exist. But in order to go with the story, we are actually willingly considering, okay, let us say that this has happened, now let us see what has happened after that. So that is magic realism. Also, you will find magic realism in the works of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Marquez is one of the best writers that ever wrote in English. Gabriel Garcia Marquez is, if you read A Hundred Years of Solitude, you will never forget that novel for your entire life. Charlie Jane Anders, accomplished writer and editor, non-binary, several science fiction novels including all the birds in the sky and the city in the middle of the night which combine elements of science fiction and fantasy. Charlie Jen Anders, so we have a total of Anali Newitz, Neon Yang, Kai Cheng Thom, uh, Charlie Jane Anders, then uh, we have RKD Martin, an author and historian, identifies as non-binary, debut novelist, a memory called Empire won the Hugo Award. See, this is also a Hugo Award winning novelist, right? So, Arkady Martin, if anywhere uh, it is requested, you, you might understand that this particular person who being a non-binary writer has received uh, equal 
prestige equal recognition as Clark or Asimov or Heinlein and even um, Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin. So, they, he of course, this person did not win multiple Hugos, but uh, at least won one Hugo award for best novel in 2020 and is part of a space opera series exploring themes of identity, colonialism and power. So, the space operas that she has written is also a kind of commentary on all these subtopics identity, colonialism and power. Then we have non-binary characters in science fiction. Till now we were talking about authors. So, now we will talk about characters. Are there any characters that we can ca say that this character in this science fiction novel is non-binary, does not belong to the men-women kind of distinction, right? So, we have them and ancillary justice. When we will be discussing about the awards, seminars, convention, conferences, you will see that this book has received a lot of awards. Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie. The protagonist of this novel is an AI spacecraft with ancillaries, human bodies that serve as extensions of its consciousness, as the AI does not possess a gender identity. So, the AI does not have a gender identity, it keeps on, you know, making mistakes, it keeps on what should I say, the human beings are not able to understand uh, the AI, the AI is having trouble, is tra having trouble in understanding the human beings because there is no gender identity of an AI, right. The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin, the Genthians, the Genthanians are a humanoid race, humanoid means a race which looks like a human being, humanoid race with an androgynous biological nature. Androgynous is a very interesting concept that you have both the uh, sexual organs, you have the sexual organs of a male, perfectly healthy sexual organs of a male and also you have the perfectly healthy sexual organs of a female. So, that way your body is androgynous or androgynous. They are not male or female most of the time. So, most of the time they do not show any particular adherence to any idea. They do not say that I am a male or I am a female. They are just there. They are creatures, um, but can become either male or female during their mating cycle called Khmer. So, they only have a mating cycle at a particular period of time where if they want to be a male, they can be a ma male or if they want to be a female, they can also become a female. So, this kind of fluidity, this kind of unfixed nature of gender creates a lot of discourses in this particular um, novel, The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. Again, let me remind you, it belongs to the Hainish cycle of novels and uh, short stories written by Le Guin. The Tensoret, we were just discussing series by J. W. Yang. See, here we have just discussed Neon Yang. Earlier, he was known as J. Y. Yang. So, J. Y. Yang, this series features a fantasy world with non-binary characters and fluid concepts of gender. The protagonists, twins Akeha and Mokoya are raised in a society that does not strictly adhere to gender binary roles. So, in this particular novel, you will find twins Akea and Mokoya are raised in a society, they are being raised in a society which do not have fixed gender binary roles. There is no fixed nature of uh, masculinity or femininity, there is no such expression. So, in this particular novel, gender is a fluid as a concept. Then we have non-binary characters in The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Sisyx and Andrisk, a reptilian species with a complex gender identity that includes both male and female aspects. I am sure you understand where this story has gained its inspiration from. It is Le Guin's uh, The Left Hand of Darkness, where the creatures can assume 
uh, uh, their, they can assume the biology of a male or a female during their mating season. That idea has been explored and exploited in this particular book by Becky Chambers, where she is um, discussing only a different kind of species in a different kind of setting. Mask of Shadows by Lindsay Miller. The protagonist Sal Leon is a gender fluid thief. Now let us consider this. Till this time, we were considering gender fluid identities fine, people, the protagonists, all of them. But here, the protagonist is not only gender fluid, but is also a criminal. So it is very fascinating, how does that work? Who auditions to become one of the queen's assassins. So this thief turns his um, way, turns his bad qualities into good qualities. He does not remain a thief anymore. Now this person is an assassin. Explore Sal's gender identity and challenges societal expectations. Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee. This military science fiction novel, so this one is a military science fiction novel, it is not any other dystopian world novel, includes characters with diverse gender expressions and identities. The character Cheris is a Kel. Kel is a kind of a culture, a culture with its own unique gender concepts. So when we talk about Kel, Kel is an imaginary culture that is created by Yoon Ha Lee in this particular novel. So in this culture, the gender identities are different from what we see over here. Here there is male, female, here there is lesbian, gay, transsexual, bi, uh, bisexual and transgender. But there it is not like the way we see gender identities in our reality. So it is a military science fiction novel. The Stars Are Legion, the last novel we will be discussing here today. The Stars Are Legion by Cameron Hurley. The characters come from a society of all female spaceships and the story features characters with diverse gender identities. So the spaceships that appear in the story and the characters who come from that spaceships all are females. So there is no place for males. Uh, I am sure when we were talking about utopia and dystopia, you might have come across this kind of idea that the society is dominated by women, that all the women are there, no men are on the street, that all the men are killed. So this kind of idea, it's a, it's a feminist utopia, we discussed that, right? So this is also a kind of feminist utopia and uh, uh, with diverse gender identities. Now let us take a small time out of all the busy schedule that you might be having and think about whatever the things that we have discussed in this lecture. Who are some prominent women authors in the science fiction genre and what are their most notable works featuring female protagonists? Now I have asked, I have given you the question, number one is who are the women authors and the number two is most notable works but there is a condition featuring female protagonists. So for this you need to go and research and find out how many science fiction works are there with female protagonists. In what ways women authors in science fiction challenged traditional gender roles through their portrayal of female characters. So now for this you will have to go and read the stories of some of the authors like Le Guin or uh, the, you, you can read The Left Hand of Darkness, you can read Margaret Atwood, uh, The Handmaid's Tale and try to understand what are the things that these novels have challenged or questioned. What traditions our society follows that has been called into question in these kind of novels. Can you identify any recurring themes or motives in the works of non-binary authors in science fiction, particularly regarding the depiction of non-binary characters. So if there is a science fiction where their non-binary characters are there, what are the likely themes? Let me tell you one of the likely themes is that the planet is different. That is something we uh, have been reading, right? So in order to keep these characters 
or make these characters relatable because in our society there is no place for this kind of characters. But we want to bring this kind of characters to the discourse and thereby normalize everything. So, for that we have to talk about a different planet in the beginning. Okay? Discuss the contribution of Octavia Estelle Butler to the revising of the set patterns of science fiction writing and reception. So, what contributions did Octavia Estelle Butler made? Exactly what are the things? How did she suffer and what did she and how did she rise? She was pushed back by the publisher, but she showed resilience and pushed the publishers back until she hunted for a publishing house, she got herself published and she achieved what she dreamt. Gender roles are questioned, subverted and played with the many science fiction works. In the many science fiction works, what positive purpose it may directly or indirectly serve with reference to readership? Here we can discuss, let us say, why are we including gender related topics in the domain of science fiction. Science fiction can be science fiction, it is talking about story, it is talking about future, it is talking about technology. So, why introduce the element of gender or the issues of gender in science fiction? So, number one point is normalize. Normalize LGBTQ because the readership that we have over here, science fiction readership mostly is dominated by young adults, teenagers who are just beginning their life. They are going to make the maximum strength of the society after 10 years. So, if we start introducing uh, the concepts of gender, if we start telling them, making them understand the concept of gender, then they will help us to build a better society, build a more inclusive society. And in order to get their attention, in order to know that they will listen, we have to put it within the science and technological realms which are much more popular among the young adults today. I hope you understand this point because this is very vital. So, this gives us the purpose of writing science fiction. This gives us the purpose of including gender related elements, gender issues inside the narrative structure of science fiction, right. So, this is a list of references, very good references. Anytime you want to have an idea of what are the rubrics, what are the rudiments of gender issues, how they gender and science fiction are connected, how women are represented in the works of science fiction, how non-binary authors, non-binary characters, women characters play a huge role in the uh, domain of science fiction. You can just go and find these books on Google Scholar. These are available for free. Gender in Science Fiction, Decoding Gender in Science Fiction, A New Species, Gender and Science in Science Fiction, Gender and Environment in Science Fiction, Resistance Reexamined, Gender Fan Practices and Science Fiction Television, Resistance Reexamined, Gender Fan Practices, Helford's book Fantasy Girls, Gender in the New Universe of Science Fiction and Fantasy Television. Personally, I prefer this concept very much because uh, the moment gender comes into question environment is also something which comes along with it. So, uh, if you want more information just type in women non-binary authors and science fiction in Google scholar you will get a load of um, all the research articles presented all the research papers written on this particular topic. I hope this has been a very informative and aware, awarenessful kind of thing for all of us so that we can raise a better generation, right. So, stay tuned to this lecture series. I hope we will discuss much more and you will get 
to learn a lot of things from this. Thank you very much for being so patient listeners. See you in the next lecture. I am Professor A.K. Sharma and I teach Sociology in IIT Kanpur. Uh, I am taking up a question, uh, what is world population crisis? Uh, world population crisis uh, refers to explosive growth of population which occurred during 1950s and 1960s. For uh, millions of years, uh, some people estimate that perhaps man appeared on this planet earth 5 lakhs years ago. It took uh, these 5 lakhs years for world population to reach first billion in 1820 AD. And that means that the population in ancient times must have been rising at rate 0 0.000 something percent per year. Now, in 1950s and 1960s in the world, you find the population is started growing at rate more than 2 percent per year. This is what is meant by population crisis. You can imagine that if a population grows or anything grows at 2 percent per year, then in about 35 years time it can double. And obviously, uh, particularly in the context of less developed countries, it had implications for poverty removal, for employment generation, for maintaining health, improving life expectancy, raising educational levels, etc., etc. The reason behind this uh, population crisis was uh, improvement in life expectancy or improvement in general health standards of populations. Uh, you may not be knowing or you will be surprised to know that about 100 years ago in our country, life expectancy means average age of death or average age of life, whatever you say, of a newly born child was only 20 years and today it has reached the level of 68 years. Much of this improvement in less developed countries occurred uh, in 1950s and 60s. And therefore, uh, with improvement in health, improvement in life expectancy or average age of birth, uh, average age of death, and population started growing at explosive rates and people started writing about this. This is population explosion or this, this is population crisis. And uh, uh, now one can say that the period of peak growth rate is over and from 1971 onwards in the world as well as in our country, growth rate of population has started declining. Now, in India you may like to know what is the current growth rate of India's population. Currently India's population is growing at 1.5 percent per year and the reason is that after uh, uh, sudden or unexpected improvement in health conditions in 50s and 60s which led to population crisis, we find that today average number of children has also started coming down. So, there was a time when average number of children per woman was around 11 or 12, now it has come down to 2.5 and therefore, the growth rate of India's population has come down to 1.5 percent and we can hope that in the future means in the coming decades, even if nothing changes on the front of fertility or number of children, 
India's growth rate of population will decrease further and eventually come to a zero level. As said by the 11th five year plan of India, and now the major cause of high growth rate of population is not high fertility, but the age distribution of population. So, we have a, a high percentage of population at the younger ages, and that, uh, that is the cause of high rate of growth of population. Eventually, when population of India will also age like population of other developed countries, our growth rate will start falling. Thank you. Now, we will meet in the future. Sir.